Cardiff University. We're going to talk about generalized rate categories. So, firstly, my big thanks to Ernesto for inviting me here and giving me a chance to give this talk in this wonderful place. So, uh, I don't expect anybody to have heard about generalized rate category because that's essentially a new object which, I, which I'm going to introduce in this talk. So, some of the people present in this audience over the last oh, number of years have been listening to talks by myself and my co-author Renan, which started off as sort of being honest algebraic geometry and then progressed into the technical wilderness of DG enhancements and infinity enhancements and whatnot. So I thought I'd sort of put together this talk which essentially says that you know behind our interest in spherical functors, p factors and all these sort of technical gadgets stands a sort of genuine geometrical problem which we need all this technology to solve. So this is sort of a program where all the stuff that we do and all the papers we put out sort of fits in. So but before sort of telling what the generalized braid category is, let me sort of uh, remind you of what an ordinary sort of braid group is which uh, with generalized braid category is meant to generalize. Now, I suspect there are quite a few people, uh, quite a few uh, people in this room who know uh, what a brain group is. However, I sort of, I will quickly run over this material in order to draw some parallels with what I'm going to introduce later. So the elements, so there are sort of two outlooks on brain group. First one is that it's a, cer it's a certain sort of topological trinket. So the elements of, of, the, of uh, BRM are M braids, configurations of N disjoint pieces of string with N fixed endpoints. So here are some examples of elements of BR5. Uh, now, these configurations of, oh yeah, and uh, the pieces of string are not, are not allowed to loop back. So these are considered up to isotopies, which keep the strands disjoint. So uh, you can sort of continuously transform this, but at no point must two strings touch each other. So the composition is defined by concatenation. So that's a sort of typical example of what happens. You have these two braids, then you sort of stick them together, and then you can use isotopy to smooth it out. So in this case, we saw that these two elements are actually inverse to each other. So, so crossing one way, Composed with crossing another way gives you identity element. And the fact that this is identity that the identity element is given by n parallel strands also follows immediately from composition being continuation. So you can also view it pure algebraically. You have a group which is generated by n generators, which generator Ti and its inverse correspond to so crossing is one way. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, these are subject to well-known braid relations. So, if the indices, so the, if, if basically if two crossings happen far apart, if the indices are more than one apart of the crossings, then uh, they just commute, and uh, so-called commutation condition. And if you try to uh, look at how the adjacent crossings interact, then you have these braiding conditions: T I T J T I is T G. So now the sort of beginnings of the story that we are interested in is this uh, categorification story. So if you have a group, you can act on it on sort of a vector space, on a variety, but you can also act by a group on a category. So I will tell you about a, a sort of well-known result of Hovenoff and Thomas. They actually proved it for a, about the affine braid group, but for the simplicity, let's sort of just look at that categorification of the of just ordinary brain group. So let FLM denote variety of complete flux. So you have this sequence of subspaces in CN, dimension of VI is I. And then T star of FLM is the cotangent bundle of uh, complete flux variety, which I consider as a sort of well, algebraic variety of its own, so I take its total space. And then all the derived categories in this talk will be bound the derived categories of coherent sheaves. So D, and they'll denote it by D with no indices. So the result proved by Honor and Thomas in about 2005 is that there is a categorical auction of the braid group on 
the derived category of complete flow of cotangent bundle to complete flow variety. So to be more precise, let me tell you how that works. So let FLM with I hat denote the partial flux variety where we keep all the subspaces except for dimension I subspace, which we skip out. Then there's a following geometrical construction. So first of all, we have a forgetful map. If you have a complete flux, you can just forget dimension I subspace and get, a part, and get the partial flux in FLM I hat. Now, uh, this map is a P1 bundle because you are, uh, by forgetting uh, this sort of uh, dimension i uh, subspace, uh, you, you are still sandwiched between, between dimension i minus 1 and dimension i plus 1 subspaces, so you're in C2 and you're choosing a one-dimensional subspace of C2. So we have a P1 choices uh, over every, above every partial flood like, like this. Now, what you can do is you can take cotangent bundle on the partial flux variety and pull it back to get a vector bundle on the complete flux variety. And then I can consider its total space. So, as you, so this is now sort of a variety of itself. Now, this comes equipped with a projection to the cotangent bundle here. An element here is a complete flux with the tangent vector, vector which belongs to the partial flux. So there is a projection where we, where we forget about tangent vector. And then this is just the same P1 bundle here. But also, we can include this into the cotangent bundle of the uh, complete uh, flux variety by considering the tangent vector here and the sort of tangent vector here. Now that's a divisorial inclusion. So this is a divisor inside here. So, you, so we have a P1 bundle, sort of dimension one, uh, sort of vibration with fibers of dimension one, and we have a dimension one uh, inclusion here. So this is a sort of typical setup where uh, spherical functors arose, and indeed, define SI to be the functor which goes from direct category of this variety, direct category of this variety, by taking first the pullback this divisor and then taking a direct image inside here. So pi i upper star and then i yoga i lower star. Then firstly for each i uh, from 1, 1, 2, n minus 1, uh, this functor is a spherical functor. So you get notice that this base variety will change. For by varying i, you get a bunch of functors from derived category of each corresponding partial flux variety to the same derived category of total flux variety. Each of these functors is spherical. Now, spherical functors, a uh, number of people have told us about them. The thing about a spherical functor is that if you put a spherical functor from here to here, it produces a lot of equivalence of the target variety and of the source variety. Here we are interested in the odd equivalences of the target variety, so-called spherical twists. The odd equivalences here are called spherical co-twists. And uh, yeah, sorry, this is a typo. This should be TI. So a TI inside the odd inside the group of odd equivalences of uh, direct category of a complete flat variety is a spherical twist about uh, the spherical function S I. So out for each partial flux variety, for each dimension we skip, we obtain the not equivalence of the, of the direct category of complete flux variety. And assigning uh, each of these not equivalences to the braid group generator TI defines a categorical option of the braid group on uh, this uh, direct category of complete flux variety. So that's the result of common and Thomas. Now, how do you usually prove this? Well, you have generators. All you need to know is you want to write down the Fourier Mugai kernel for each of those functors. And then you want to verify that for Fourier Mugai kernels, uh, the uh, braid relations hold. That's a rather messy computation which Thomas carried out. Actually, uh, we have for ages had a paper in progress which, needs, which needed some of this technology we've been developing, which says that uh, actually there is a very general geometrical criteria. If you have a, if, if 
you have a variety, ambient variety, no longer anything to do with uh, arbitrary variety, nothing to do with uh, flux. And it has inside it n vibrations, so it has n sub-varieties, each of which is fibered over a base. Then you can describe it perfectly geometrically how these vibrations must interact, intersect with each other in order uh, for the uh, for these functors. Uh, well, for a person, the vibration could be spherical, so you have ambient variety, um, sub variety, and a base. So we want this functor to be spherical, and then if the geometrical criteria for the intersection hold, uh, the spherical twists will break. So there is a way basically to analyze what happens here and uh, bring uh, this braid relations down to geometry as opposed to just the brute force of the equations. But uh, there is a sort of more interesting question. I haven't written this down on the slide, but there is, uh, you can sort of, and the reason I haven't written this down is because I'm going to say something very vague. Kautis and Kamnitz are defined a categorical action of a tangle calculus. So instead of braid, you have braids, you have essentially tangles. And that can sort of be uh, identified uh, the varieties whose derived categories are uh, on which uh, this tangle calculus act can sort of be ident identified with spring of fibers inside complete and partial flock varieties. So uh, somehow you can extend, we know that you can sort of extend this uh, braid group to a richer structure, which is no longer a group, but sort of a category, and uh, which uh, involves not just complete flat variety, but all the partial flat varieties. However, what we, when we looked at what you get there, we realized that tangle calculus by Cautis and Kamnitzer does not act. It only works on the springer fibers inside the flat variety. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work on the whole thing. So you have a more complicated structure acting on the whole direct factors of complete and partial flat varieties, which simplifies the tang to tangle calculus from the slices that come to the So in order to describe what acts uh, there instead of tangle calculus, we arrive to the following definition. So first let me describe this uh, generalized braid category topologically. So generalized braids are configurations of n strands, which are, we are now doing. They're still not allowed to look back but we no longer require them to be disjoint. We allow them to overlap. However, we allow them to overlap in a very controlled way. Strands can join two at a time, continue as a multiplicity to strand, and then possibly split apart. I'll give an example in a moment. More generally, any two st strands with multiplicities P and Q can join up and continue as a strand with multiplicity P plus Q, and then sort of possibly split up. Any strand with higher multiplicity can split into two strands with lower multiplicity. It's important that we only allow for strands to join or split up two at a time uh, at most. So here are some generalized braids. So here we start with this classical configuration of disjoint strands. And now, yeah, uh, this is, we're not, uh, so this is a sort of bad diagram because you, we, must we must always specify the order in which strands come together. So let's say that here, first these two strands come together and then this one joins them. So, and then uh, you can have, uh, so this strand crosses over this one, and this one just doesn't interact with them at all. So a more interesting example is this. You have, firstly, you, you can start as a multiple strand and go happily throughout the whole braid while still being this multiplicity two strand. Here we have multiplicity two and multiplicity one strand joining together, continuing and splitting apart like this. So, of course, the question is, what sort of isotopies do I allow? So essentially, I will elaborate on this in, in a few seconds. They must preserve the intervals where strands come together. They must preserve the number of intervals, and they must preserve the order in which strings join in the interval. For example, here is what we allow it to do to these intervals by isotopy. Suppose you have a simple situation. What you allow it to do is you can make an interval bigger, you can sort of elongate the interval where strands join together. Or you can make it short, or you can make it shorter. <laughs> what you're not allowed to do is you cannot take an interval and make it so small that it splits apart completely. 
What you're also not allowed to do is you're not allowed to take two intervals and elongate them so elongate them so much that they join up. And instead of two intervals, you end up with one interval. Finally, you're not allowed to change the order in which this in which the strings come together. So you're not allowed to do this essentially. <sighs> now, well, are you allowed to change them if you have strands that don't fetch each other? Or are you allowed to change the order? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see, we'll see the so I must say that uh, I'm sort of have, I'm very interested. Uh, I'm, this is something we sort of came up empirically by looking at the uh, sort of uh, what do those derived functions behave like on flat varieties. This is this may not be a final definition. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of writing it out. So I'll be if if, if anyone here has encountered uh, anything like this in their research, I'd be very interested to hear that. So, since strands have multiplicity, we must allow endpoints to have multiplicity as well. So instead of a single configuration of n disjoint endpoints, we have multiple endpoint configurations, which are all indexed by partitions of n. The composition is again given by concatenation of endpoints much. So here is a sort of a really, you know, sort of a more substantial example. So we have two general things <coughs> like this. So this is a partition of three, one, two. This is another partition of three, two, one. This is also two, one, so they match. So what we can do is we can take uh, the concatenation. And then this is what we're allowed to do isotopy-wise. So in particular, this was our original. So the really complicated question in this business is how to define, uh, as you will see in a moment, these intersections, these sort of crossings over of strands. And this sort of thing allows you to reduce them, essentially, to, uh, to sort of to have a whole of an inductive procedure, which would reduce uh, definition to crossings of lower multiplicity. But it turned out, as you will see now, we don't have to do that. And well, of course, when the endpoint is not much, the, the composition is zero. So algebraically, sort of, you arrive to the following definition. A generalized braid category has object set partitions of n. So I'll write them as this vector k underscore. It will have sort of uh, partition k1 block km such that the sum of all k's is n. So morphism spaces, you know, uh, for any two partitions of n, I define the morphism space between them. I generalize braids whose initial and endpoints configurations are k and k dash up to isotope. Composition is concatenation if endpoints match in zero otherwise. And finally, identity is part of strong braids. So for each uh, partition of n, we have this sort of parallel configuration. So all the morphisms in generalized braid category are generated by a composition by the following four basic types. You have joinings, to, to, so two multiple strands coming together and nothing happening in the rest of the braid. Splittings, crossings over one way and sort of crossings over the other way. So these are subject to generalized braid relations. And sort of our goal number one, this is very much a work in progress, is to, uh, and, but this one we'll, we hope to have uh, sort of done uh, very shortly, which means within a year. Uh, so we want to write down these generalized braid relations for these morphisms above. So we want to write down essentially the relations which need to be checked. For, so then to categorify generalized braid category, you need to exhibit a functor for each of these four basic types, and you need to then check that these functors satisfy these braid relations. So here is sort of what we believe happens with flat varieties. So for each uh, partition of M, denote uh, by FLN K the corresponding partial flat variety. So if this partition consists of K1 plus KM, then we have subspaces VK1, VK1 plus uh, K2, and so on until VK1 plus, plus KM, which is, this is M, so this is just uh, the whole vector space. So just to give an example, uh, observe that if you have a sort of complete partition all once, then uh, the corresponding partial flat variety is the complete flat variety because you have one, one plus one is two, one plus one plus one is three, and so on. the second kind of the opposite example, if you consider partition one n minus one, then what you get is p n minus one because you have p one and then you go straight to c n. The choice of one dimensional space in c n is p n minus one. And uh, 
partition M, N minus M, is the Grassmannian of M planes in M space. And then XK uh, under uh, X sort of under cross K is my total space of the cotangent bundle on this partial flat product. And then we actually have very similar uh, construction to um, Holman and Thomas, except that we are actually interested in the sort of functors themselves and not just their twists. So let SI uh, be a PQ splitting, which splits I thread into uh, multiplicity P, and P plus Q into the thread of multiplicity P and thread of multiplicity Q. So this means that this KI is P plus Q, this, and then this gets split into P and Q, and so nothing happens anywhere else. Just as before, we have a forgetful map between the corresponding flat varieties, bunch of flat varieties, which just forgets the, this extra um, subspace which we have in this situation. And this will be a Grassmannian P, P plus Q bundle just as before we had a P1 bond. So in the whole of the Thomas case, we, have, we, had, we were dealing with SI essentially 1-1, uh, one, one, when we had uh, double strands leading into uh, two single strands. And Grassmannian 1-2 is, of course, P1. So then we can pull back the cotangent bundle to here, take its total space. This has a natural projection where we just forget about the tangent vector which lands you in a cotangent bundle here, which is a Grassmannian bundle. Now, this is no longer a divisorial inclusion. It's an, it's an inclusion whose co-dimension is precisely the dimension of this Grassmannian. And now we define SI k, k dash to be the functor pull, ba um, sort of pull back and direct image plus a line bundle twist, which um, now that's sort of, uh, that exactly which line bound twist will need to be worked out. And then we claim that the following situation happens. If you assign to every object of the, of the generalized product category, every partition of M, the derived category of the cotangent bundle of the corresponding flag variety, if you, to each splitting, you assign the SI functor defined on the previous page, so each splitting goes to this functor from the uh, partial flat uh, uh, between the partial flat varieties, which works like this. To each joining, you just assign a right adjoint of the splitting functor. To each crossing, now that's where we were stuck sort of for a long time. We we were going to define this using an inductive procedure, and that's where why we went into this uh, now. I forgot to mention one thing. So this is only spherical when P and Q is one and one. Uh, when P is one and Q is n minus one, this is a what's known in literature as P functor, as a PN functor, in fact. And uh, uh, this, in, in a sense, the uh, uh, and that sort of generates an odd equivalence, but um, and when uh, this is quite general, now there is no notion of Grassmannian functor in the literature. But in fact, after sort of thinking about this for a while, we've realized that most likely uh, there, is no, there shouldn't be a notion of Grassmannian functor. There should be just a notion of uh, Grassmannian system. But uh, I, don't, I, sort of, I don't have time to go into that. But um, what certainly happens is that there is a countess cummins or liquid, liquid equivalence, which via sort of complicated uh, geometrical representation theory, uh, what they call categorical auction of uh, SLM, uh, they construct an equivalent, derived equivalence between cotangent bundle of Grassmannian and cotangent bundle of the dual Grassmannian. And that's precisely uh, what we need for our crossings. Indeed, uh, sort of. Uh, and then for the for course, the, for, for the inverse crossing, you, you just assign the inverse of this equivalence. So when you have one n minus one case, this functor is a p functor. 
and essentially this equivalence plus uh, composed with another such uh, so basically ti k k dash composed with ti not ti minus one k dash k is a non-trivial or the equivalence of uh, the source variety which is basically the p twist there is and the kind of hope is that whatever notion of Grassmannian twist which will come out of this will uh, will also uh, be just composition of two counties counties are equal equivalences. So this sort of takes care of the lot of it. For every object and for each of the four types of generating morphisms, we have defined the four corresponding parameters. This sort of uh, spherical PN and, well, uh, Grasslanian in a sense functors, they are right adjoints and the corresponding equivalences. And, this sh and then we believe that this is subject to generalized greater relations than the biological model we've described, and this defines a categorical action of this uh, generalized rate category. So I believe I'm out of time. Any questions? Does the action, and I guess could you actually this guy, is that uh, going to uh, give you an action on the, on the DG pre-triangulated category? Uh, good question. I mean, uh, Sort of uh, some years ago, I would have said immediately yes, because of course uh, the stuff that we build, uh, um, the stuff that we build is uh, all, all our constructions work by DG enhancements. All these sort of twists uh, are constructed uh, essentially by a sort of uh, twisted complexes of uh, things in enhancement. But I think that uh, I'm sort of comfortable to say that uh, up, sort of up. Uh, Wouldn't there be some sort of higher amount of these type of things to Yes, uh, I mean, already in spherical powers, you do not get everything clean in the dimension work. You have built up with, uh, build up with sort of how it is there. Uh, so you, you don't have a clean adjunction upstairs. And uh, I don't think, uh, so I, I don't think this will, be, this will lift to uh, the auction uh, on the corresponding sort of DJ enhancement. Oh, uh, uh, so it, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I was, I was just about to say, what happens with spherical functors and what will happen with p functors, which we are putting out the paper uh, out on shortly. And what will happen here is that uh, everything will be defined up in DG enhancements, but it will define action only up to homotopy. No, no, I, I mean, there's so. no notion of homotopy action, which is, uh, I mean, not doesn't it's it's literally. Uh, so, uh, uh, no, no, I, I mean, uh, this. Uh, Say even when a group acts on a category, it's too strong to assume that uh, 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 it's x literally. There's a of action like the local system of BG. So here, a sim similar story. So you shouldn't uh, try to act, act literally on a DG category. Yeah. But so, but the, the group will be the group uh, as a k by one of the group and not some not with some higher homotopy thing. Uh, it's not clear that you. That Take sort of the the infinity group that's generated by those generators and relations. That might not be the same as the one you want to call. It. At the moment, all I'm sort of, uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not really comfortable uh, at saying what will happen, uh, how how well we can sort of uh, uh, control higher homotopies. All I'm happy to say is that the, the generalized braid relations will hold. Each each of the, each individual one will hold up to some homotopy. What will happen to homotopies there? Well, let, let us verify the <laughs> braid relations on the on the sort of simplest level first, then we'll see what happens to the higher homotopies.